chapter 10 here and uh so we'll get into outs and bases and then um we obviously will take the exam on wednesday during lecture time uh so again i may post either maybe the rest of this as well uh, just to keep us on track to see where we are so acid and bases uh first off when we talk about acids you know it's uh acids they have a uh a sour taste. Um, you obviously shouldn't taste any acids in the lab or bases in the lab, uh, but um, they do cause uh, changes in litmus paper. So commonly when we're dealing with acid and bases, uh, we sometimes will use litmus paper, which is really just a plant dye. And typically if you put your solution on litmus paper and it turns red, that usually indicates that the solution is acidic. So either the litmus paper goes maybe from blue to red, or it uh, stays red, I suppose. Uh, that usually indicates an acidic solution. Acids can also react with uh, metals to produce hydrogen in a single replacement reaction, uh, like magnesium plus some HCl, a single replacement reaction where this guy comes in and kicks out the hydrogen. The result of that is hydrogen gas gets formed, and in this case, a little magnesium chloride action if you've done this experiment probably one of those chemical reaction ones uh you would see bubbles forming and that is the hydrogen gas that has been generated aqueous acid solutions do conduct electricity so acids can be strong acids or weak acids uh, which means they can be strong electrolytes or weak electrolytes which we talked about in the other chapter uh, Bases, on the other hand, have a bitter taste. They feel slippery. A lot of soaps, drain cleaners, things like that are bases. Uh, they also will change litmus paper, but typically it will change it to blue. Uh, so again, if you are using litmus paper, and usually you might be using red litmus paper at this point, and you touch uh, your solution to the paper and it turns blue, then it is basic. Uh, also, there are strong bases and also uh, weak bases as well, which are strong and weak electrolytes. Now, acids, on the other hand, um, for the basic definition of an acid is the ability to produce H plus or hydrogen ions in solution. They're also sometimes referred to as protons, and that's because hydrogen has a proton it has an electron, but it does not have a neutron. So in order for it to become positively charged, it had to lose an electron. So the only thing left is a proton. So H plus is commonly called a proton in acid-base chemistry or the hydrogen ion. In acid-base chemistry, H plus and H3O plus, which is the hydronium ion, They are basically the same thing, yeah. So both in sort of chemical equations, also in formulas, uh, they're used interchangeably. I personally use H plus a lot of the times, but books and stuff will use H3O plus. So pretty much anywhere I lay up an H plus, you could exchange it with an H3O plus. It really just means the acid part of the solution. So they both work uh, the same. Now, strong acids or strong electrolytes, which means they will 100% break apart in solution. Uh, so for example, if you had some nitric acid, which is a strong acid, when it goes for a swim in solution, it will 100% break apart into an H plus and a nitrate ion. And this is 100% what you have in solution. And that's what makes it really a strong acid because as soon as it goes for a swim, it will produce a lot of H plus really quickly. And that's basically your definition of an acid. So it's able to produce that H plus in solution really quickly and a lot of it. And that makes it a strong acid. Um, <clears throat> A list of some strong acids, which are good ones to sort of know. Uh, some strong acids are listed there, but here's uh, again, sort of maybe the completed list. HCl, which is hydrochloric acid.
H2SO4, which is sulfuric acid. Uh, HNO3, which we just wrote there, which was nitric acid. HClO4, which is perchloric acid. HBr, which is hydrobromic acid. And HI is hydroiodic acid. So this list of sort of six acids, these are basically your strong acids that you probably will maybe come across and only come across. What that means is essentially, if it is uh, somebody that's not one of those, it's probably pretty safe to assume that it's a weak acid. So those are pretty much your six strong acids, which means each one of those, when they go into solution, uh, will not stay together. They will 100% break apart into the ions and make them strong acids. Uh, there are some weak acids that we commonly kind of come across, and I'll list just some of them. Uh, hydrofluoric acid, um, acetic acid, This is also written a couple of different ways. So sometimes it's written as C2H4O2, it's the same thing. Um, so those are a couple of uh, weak acids. And like I said, pretty much if it's not one of those, it's probably a, a weak acid. If it's not one of those strong acids that's on the list. Any questions on that there? <laughs> Now, sort of the difference between a weak acid and a strong acid, as we will see, if it's a weak acid, it is a weak electrolyte. So as we talked about, I think when we talked about electrolytes, something like hydrofluoric acid will actually stay together pretty much in solution, but will produce a little of these ions. And because it's still able to produce a little bit of those ions, it is still... Uh, consider it an acid because it's able to produce a little bit of H plus in solution. It will not be able to produce anywhere near the amount of H plus that obviously uh, something like a strong acid below it there would be able to do, um, but it's still able to consider that. We also typically see with our weak acids, our arrows that we talked about when we talked about weak electrolytes heading in both directions, uh, which indicate that it is a weak acid. Any questions on there? <clears throat> Now, bases on their hand are also, uh, there are a lot of bases that are strong bases. And bases basically have the ability to produce hydroxide or OH minus in solution. Uh, a lot of strong bases come from group one and two on the periodic table. So group one and group two, kind of starting like where sodium is coming around this way. Any of those guys with hydroxide uh, typically will be a kind of a strong base. Uh, so something like sodium hydroxide, like we see there at the bottom, when it goes into solution, it is a strong base, which means it will 100% break apart into sodium ions and hydroxide ions. And it is, again, this presence of a lot of hydroxide ions really quickly. Uh, which makes it a strong base. Basically, all it has to do is go for a swim. It will produce some hydroxide and it'll make it a strong <clears throat> uh, base. Again, in solution, 100% of what you have are these ions. You have basically none of these units still together. They've all basically broken apart and are floating around. So in the beaker, you basically got sodium ions and you got hydroxide ions floating around. Again, it's the presence of those hydroxide ions, which uh, makes it a base. <clears throat> Alkali metals, right? Alkaline earth metals, uh, group one and group two on the periodic table. The word alkaline 
means basic. Yeah. So that's where a lot of our strong uh, bases do come from. Much like acids, if it's a strong base, it will 100% break apart. And much like acids, there are some weak bases that you sometimes come across. I would say probably the most common weak base that you'd probably see in this class would be NH3. NH3 is ammonia. Ammonia, not ammonium, but ammonia, right? And as you can see, the actual formula for NH3 does not contain hydroxide. But what happens when ammonia goes for a swim with water is it is able to basically take an H plus there from water. And what it does is it makes NH4 plus and OH minus. So this is why it is still considered a base because it can react with water and make hydroxide, but it definitely will make a lot less hydroxide than something like sodium hydroxide. Again, sodium hydroxide just needs to go in for a swim and it will break apart into ions and you'll have hydroxide. Ammonia has got to go find a water, do a little reaction to produce the hydroxide. So it's still able to do it, which is why it's a weak base, but it's not going to produce as much hydroxide as something like sodium hydroxide. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> so let's talk a bit about some uh, reactions between a strong acid and a strong base. Whenever you take a strong acid and a strong base together, which I think we talked about when we talked about types of reactions, when you take a strong acid plus a strong base together, you will always get basically two things formed. You'll get a salt and water that is formed. A salt is an ionic compound. And water obviously is H2O. So for example, if you took hydrochloric acid, which is a strong acid, plus sodium hydroxide, which is a strong base. And if you remember, this really falls under the double displacement sort of reaction. This guy is positive and negative. This guy here is positive and negative, which means our positive guy will come over here and this positive guy will come over here. And when they do so, that is pretty much how water is made. It is made from the H from the acid and the OH from the base will come together basically here and make water. <clears throat> And what is left over is the sodium ion, which is plus one, gets together with the chloride ion, which is minus one. And this will make our salt over here. So our sodium chloride would be our salt. So it really is just a double displacement reaction. If you remember, one of the reasons why a reaction takes place is the formation of water, which is basically what is happening here. And that's basically what this is showing. Ultimately, whenever you take pretty much any combination of a strong acid, and you mix it with a strong base, pretty much what you're making is water. You can't maybe visually see that you made water, but uh, that's basically what is happening. That is the basic overall reaction that is taking place. And it's always the H plus from the acid gets together with the OH minus from the base. So that is how you get to your water. And then pretty much the anion, are the negative guy from the acid and the positive guy or the cation from the base come together to make your salt. So that is always basically how those uh, guys come together. Any questions on that there? Like you literally could just put your hands over the H and put your hands over the OH and then put the other two things together and that will give you basically your salt uh, when you want to write a reaction like this. Questions on that there. <clears throat> so let's say we had uh, HNO3, which is an acid, plus some KOH, which is a strong base. What would you get on the other side?
while we're at it, let's say we had H2SO4, which is a strong acid, plus some sodium hydroxide. What will you get on the other side? Acid. So basically, if we look at the first one, we know we should get water. And again, the water is going to come from the H from the acid and the OH here from the base. Uh, so that is going to give me my water, basically. And when I put that together, <clears throat> we will end up with here my water. And now the salt part will come from pretty much what's left. So at this point, uh, I got K, which is K plus, group one from the periodic table. And I have nitrate, which is NO3 minus. We just want to put it together properly on the other side here. And if we do that, maybe, maybe we do that. Yeah. Uh, we will get KNO3. And again, that would obviously be our water and our salt. Again, this is H plus and NO3 minus. This guy here is K plus and OH minus. So we're basically just like a nomenclature, putting those guys together properly. And we're putting these guys together, which always will make water. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> All right, looking at the second one here, we can do really the same thing. We're going to uh, take the H plus from the acid. We're going to take the OH minus here from the base. And once again, that is where our water is going to come from. That leaves us basically two things. That leaves us Na, which is sodium, right? Which is group one, has a plus one charge. And leaves us SO4, which is a polyatomic ion, which is sulfate, which is minus two. So just like we talked about with nomenclature, can I just put those together just like that? I know I do need more of the sodium, right? So I need one more sodium to give me the proper formula of Na2SO4, right? One of those guys come together. Na2SO4. By the way, should probably balance it, put a two there in front of the sodium and a two in front of the water would balance it off correctly. Any questions on how to put those together? So again, uh, really just a double displacement. The good thing is, you know, it's gonna make water. So you could just almost write water down on the other side. And again, just put your hand over the other two parts and Put those guys together that's left basically correctly like you would do nomenclature any questions on that there all right let's get that there so here's a couple more examples of strong acids and strong bases and again on both of these cases as you can see we have our water and each of these cases are salt for the most part, the salts that are produced usually will be uh, what is referred to as being soluble. They'll just be really floating around in the solution, uh, not really doing much, just kind of floating around. They typically will not be a solid in, in a lot of cases. They could be, but usually not very often. All right, so let's talk a little bit about sort of definitions of acid and bases. So sort of the first definition our early definition of acid and bases was the Uranus definition. He did a lot of work with electrolytes. So as we talked about, there's strong electrolytes, weak electrolytes. And he had the basic definition, as we talked about there, that the acid is something that has the ability to produce H plus ions in solution. So once again, we're talking about a solution where we have free floating H plus, not attached to anything, just floating around free. Uh, is the ability basically of that to be an acid. Once again, H3O plus is the same thing. So, you know, either one of these demonstrations are basically the same thing. While a base is something that has the ability to produce OH minus in solution. Uh, so once again, that means, as I talked about earlier, 
the ability to produce OH minus that once again is just freely floating in there, not attached to anything or connected to anything. Uh, and as we'll talk about really the levels of actually both of those things, the amount of H plus that's freely floating in the solution and the amount of OH minus that's in that solution is really what makes sort of the pH of the solution what it is. Either it's gonna make it more acidic or basic. Uh, as you can probably imagine, if you have more H plus floating around freely in the solution, it will be acidic. And if you have more OH minus floating around in the solution, it will be basic. So those are really the determination, determining factor, uh, factor of what um, <clears throat> determines, you know, if it's acidic or basic. Now, there is a difference, you know, when we talk, for example, in terms of naming, like something like HCl, that's a gas, that is hydrogen chloride. If you take something like hydrogen chloride gas and you put it into water, it will actually dissolve into HCl, which will get the aqueous symbol. And typically acids will have that aqueous symbol written next to their formulas to indicate that they're basically dissolved in sort of water and solution. Um, and that's really what the difference is between those two things uh, that makes it sort of an acid. So usually it's very common when you write the formula for acids or you see the formula for acids, a lot of times they'll have that little aqueous symbol next to it to let you know that it is the acid and not something like just hydrogen chloride gas, which obviously is not an acid until it kind of bubbles through water. So it was a really good sort of... Uh, step in terms of the definition of acid and bases, but he did a lot of work with electrolytes with Venn. He did a lot of work with bases that had actually OH minus in the actual formula. Uh, and as we talked about just a second ago with ammonia, not all bases have hydroxide in it. So a more sort of general definition of acid and bases, let's spit that out, I think. Acid and bases came by, and this is what is known as the Bronsted-Lowry definition of an acid and base. And in a Bronsted-Lowry definition of an acid, an acid is a proton donor, which means it will give away an H, but not just an H, also a plus, the charge changes as well. While a base is something that will accept a proton. So once again, it will actually accept an H and a positive. It's important to remember that, it, again, it is uh, something that has a charge. So as somebody loses it and as somebody gains the H+, plus, uh, their overall charge changes. When somebody <clears throat> loses an H+, plus, they become one more negative. So if they're neutral, they become negatively charged. If somebody gains an H+, plus, they obviously become more positively charged than where they started from. So it's important, not just the H, but the actual charge changes. The sort of consequence of a Bronsted-Lowry definition, for example, uh, if we looked at our one we saw earlier, which was our NH3 plus our water, this guy is going to donate an H plus over going to make NH4 plus and OH minus. So in this case, it is the NH3 that is accepting the H plus from the water. That would make NH3 our base. It is the water that is donating the H plus over, bless you, which will make this our acid. And what happens as a result of this is it actually will make some partners on the other side of the arrow that are related to each of those guys. So for example, if we look and we can see that this NH3 is related to this guy. And the relationship between those guys is if that is the base on the left-hand side, this is the right-hand side where it is known as the conjugate acid. So the conjugate acid is related to the base. While if we look at the water on the left-hand side, which is our acid, it is related to the OH minus on this side. And this is what is known as the conjugate base. So the result of the Bronsted-Lowry definition is it actually creates pairs of things that are related to each other on opposite sides of the arrow. 
We have acids and bases on the left-hand side, our conjugate partners on the right-hand side of the arrow, and that is usually how it always is. So regular acid and bases on the left, conjugate partners on the other side of the arrow. The only difference between these guys that are pairs is exactly what was transferred. And what was transferred in this case is one single H plus. So in order for these guys to be pairs, the only difference that there could be between them is only one H plus. So there has to be only one H plus difference. When we look at NH3 on the left, it has one more H plus when it goes to the other side. So this guy over here has one more H plus. When we look at the water to the hydroxide, it has one less H plus. So that is a really important relationship between Bronsted-Lowry conjugate acid-base pairs, which is what these are sometimes called. Absolutely the only difference that there can be, it's just that one H plus. So if you look at two things that are related to each other and it's more than one H plus, they are not pairs. They're not related to each other in that sense. Uh, it could only be that one H plus. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> So here's that general reaction, as I mentioned, HA here is just a generic acid. So just a generic formula for an acid. It could be like HCl, HNO3, whatever you wanna call it. And our water, in this case, once again, the acid here is going to donate the H plus over to the water. When it does, you could think about what you make on this side. Basically, we get rid of the H and because we lost the plus, it becomes one more negative. And that is how we get to this guy over here. He went from no charge to negative one charge because he lost the H plus in that particular case. And same thing with our water. Our water there is H2O, which was neutral. It gained an H, which made it H3. And it also gained the plus, which made it H3O plus on the other side. So again, the only difference between our acid and our conjugate base and our base and our conjugate acid, once again, is the 1H plus difference between them. And it is the 1H plus that's basically being given away by the acid and accepted by the base. So that is basically the only difference there. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> Here's a HCl sort of example as well for acid conjugate base pair. Once again, the in this case, our hydrochloric acid will donate our H plus over, allowing the water in this case to accept it, which means again, in this case, the water is the base and the H3O plus would be as conjugate acid on the other side. The HCl would be the acid, the Cl minus would be the conjugate base on the right-hand side. So if you're looking for conjugate acid base pairs, that's pretty much what you should look. Just look at the two things and go, is the only difference one H plus? And if it is, then they are obviously pairs. If it is not, then again, they are not pairs in that case. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> All right. Sorry, H plus or hydronium ion. All right, let's take a look here. For each of these here, why don't we try it? Uh, are these conjugate acid base pairs? So are any of these sets of two related to each other like we just talked about from the Bronsted Lowry definition? Okay, let's take a look. So really, as we were talking about, this is what you're looking for basically is the difference one H plus basically. So there's a couple of different ways you could do it. You could just take you know both of them out and look at them. <laughs> And that would work. Uh, other thing you do is if you want, you could either put an H plus on one or take an H plus off of the other and see if they match. So I'll take the first guy, I'll take off an H plus, which means I can get rid of the H. So that's good. 
Oh, it's looking good. And when we lose the plus, we become one more negative, which means it's neutral at this point. It would become negative one, which means they match. Yeah. So that would definitely be a pair in that case. Uh, you could take uh, the next one here, HCl and ClO minus. If I take off the H and I take off the plus, do they match? They actually do not match. One is a Cl and one's a ClO, right? One has oxygen and one doesn't. And that is more than just one H plus difference, which means these guys would not be a pair in this case. Any questions on that one there? Yeah. All right, we'll take this guy here, H2PO4 minus HPO4 two minus. I'll do the same thing. I'm going to take away an H from the first one, which means I'll just have one H there, right? And if I take away a plus, I will become one more negative. It actually already is negative one. So one more negative would give me a negative two. And that's HPO4 two minus. And that is HPO4 two minus, which means those guys are also pairs. The only difference is one H plus between them. Lastly, you can... Uh, do the same thing, or if you like, you can put the H plus on the other guy. So if I put the H plus on the guy on the right, I put an H and a plus minus one and plus one gives me zero. So they now do match, right? And that means that this one would be a pair. So it looks like it is only uh, three that is not a pair. Yes. Any questions on any of that there? All right, then let's try a few more here. For each of these, write the conjugate base. So starting with each of these formulas, write its partner, that would be the conjugate base. Let's so see what you come up with. And that uh, it's an H plus, right? The key answer that most people have is like, do I put it on or take it off? That's uh, the hardest part of it. So sometimes when you're asked a question like this, it's good to think about the relationship that we saw and have been talking about that if I have an acid on this side and a base on this side, we will have some conjugate acids and conjugate bases. And the relationship is the acid on one side is related to the conjugate base on the other side while the base on one side is related to the conjugate acid. So in this particular case, we are looking to write the conjugate bases, which is this guy, which means if we think about it backwards, we are starting with right now, everybody sitting there is a acid. And the definition of an acid is something that will do what? Give the H plus or accept the H plus? I think I thought it was a good question. Is a 50-50 shot there. <laughs> Better odds than the Yankees making the World Series. Their odds are currently zero and they're making the World Series. <laughs> so an acid is something that will donate an H plus while a base is something that will accept an H plus. So if I work my way backwards here and I'm supposed to write the conjugate bases and each of these are acids, that means the definition of an acid is it should get rid of an H plus. So that is what we want to do in each of these cases. So I'm starting with H2S. I'm going to get rid of one H, which leaves me an HS. And because it was neutral and I lost the positive, I become one more negative. And it becomes HS minus in this case would be his conjugate base. Question on that one there. Next one is HS minus. So once again, it's an acid. So it will lose an H and a plus. So when it loses the H, it becomes S only. It's already negative one. So it becomes one more negative. So negative one and one more is negative two. Yeah. This guy here will lose a nitrogen. No, no, it will lose a hydrogen, which seems better, which will leave it only two hydrogens. 
Once again, it was neutral to begin with, which means it will become one more negative, which means it will be negative one in this case. And lastly, H2SO3 will lose one hydrogen. Everything else will stay the same. It had no charge to begin with, which means it then will become one more negative at this point. Any questions on any of those there? I would try something like, how about we started with HCO3 minus. Why don't you write the conjugate acid? And why don't you also write the conjugate base for this guy? So starting in both cases with this guy, write the conjugate acid. And then on the other side, write the conjugate base. All right, let's take a look. Uh, so we're looking in the first case here, got on the left conjugate acid. So if we go backwards in that particular case, uh, this thing would act as a base, which means it should accept the H plus. So we would put the H plus on going to the left there. When we put the H on, we get two H's. We get a CO3 and then a minus one and a plus one equals zero, basically. And we end up with H2CO3. Yeah. Any questions on that one there? Going to the one on the right, which is the conjugate base, kind of like what we did in this problem, going backwards tells us it is an acid, which means in this particular case, we will actually take away the H+. Plus. So taking away the H leaves us a CO3. Once again, we are starting with a minus one and we're taking away a positive charge. So we're going to become one more negative and we end up with carbonate here. Any questions on that? This is something, as you can see, can act as a acid or a base, right? In one case, it was an acid. In the other case, it was a base. Those things are what are referred to as being amphoteric. So an amphoteric substance is a substance that can either act as an acid or a base, depending on the situation. Most often occurs with something with an H and something with a negative charge. So a lot of times those guys have an H or a negative charge. They're able to kind of go both ways, depending on the situation. Uh, they can either act as an acid or a base. Any question on conjugate acid-base pairs? Uh, the, con the conjugate base... Uh, would be from the acid and the acid would get rid of the H plus if that's what you're asking. So in, in this case, uh, this was our acid going to the right. So we got rid of the H and the plus and it gave us this guy over here, which would be our conjugate base. Other questions? Okay. <clears throat> so you do have to be able to obviously identify conjugate acid-base pairs and which one is the acid or the conjugate acid. Let's talk a little bit about acid strength. Um, depending on whether it's a strong acid or a weak acid, uh, we'll have kind of two reactions that will take place. Uh, basically, if it's a strong acid, it is really like a strong electrolyte. So it really is sort of a one-way street. Everybody is coming out over here into ions, basically. If it is a weak acid, it again is a weak electrolyte, and we will have really kind of that two-way street where the acid will stay together, but will still produce some ions on this side. Uh, but mainly this is what we have, a few ions, 100% over here. So I did for that list of sort of strong acids up before. So again, any of those strong acids pretty much going to break apart and uh, again, produce a lot of H plus really quickly in that solution. If the four direction predominates, it is going to be a strong acid, which means it's completely ionized, which once again, is just a fancy way of saying this acid will 100% break apart into H plus and Cl minus. So 100% here, completely ionized or dissociated, 
means that it does not stay together at all. It just breaks apart into ions, basically. If the reverse reaction uh, predominates, again, that's going to get us our kind of reversible weak electrolyte, weak acid that's going to happen. And again, it will mainly stay together as we've been talking about here. And that would be your weak acid. Now, a couple of important sort of relationships is if you have a strong acid or if you have a strong base, its conjugate partner will be relatively weak. So it's sort of conjugate partner will be weak. Now, if you have a weak acid or even a weak base as well, you could add that in there as well. Its conjugate partner will be relatively strong. So what we mean by that, for example, is if we took something like HCl, add some water here. This acid, which is strong, means that this conjugate partner, which is the base, is weak. Basically means it will just be neutral. It's just going to hang out and all that kind of stuff. Now, if you took something like HF, which is a weak acid, as we talked about, and react with water, H3O plus and F minus. This would be a weak acid, and its conjugate partner would be the F plus, F minus, which would be the conjugate base and would be relatively strong. What that means is um, not really important for our class, but it will actually have the ability to continue to react with water. So uh, when you have something like F minus in solution with water, it's relatively strong. It'll be attracted to water and it'll actually do a reaction. And the reaction that it'll do will basically change the pH of the solution. It'll make it basic. It'll create a lot of hydroxides and stuff like that. So that's not super important for our class. We're not going to get into any of those reactions, but uh, that is sort of the relationship between the acid and base. If it comes from, if it's a strong acid or strong base, its partners will be weak. And if it's a weak acid or weak base, its conjugate partners on the other side will be relatively on the strong side. They are relatively strong. They're not as strong as like a strong acid or a strong base or anything like that. Here's our list of some of our strong acids that we had a little bit earlier. And there are some acids which can give away more than one hydrogen. And those are what are sometimes referred to as diprotic acids. So if we look at something like HCl, when it breaks apart, it is H plus and Cl minus, it only gives away basically one H plus. So this is what is sometimes referred to as a monoprotic acid. Mono obviously being one H, basically proton. Something like H2SO4 will overall give away two hydrogens. And because it gives away two hydrogens, it is what is referred to as a diprotic acid gives away basically two hydrogens. And there's even something like uh, phosphoric acid, H3PO4 will give away three hydrogens and phosphate. And it gives away three hydrogens, sometimes referred to as a triprotic acid. Triprotic obviously meaning three protons is able to give away. By the way, uh, we won't get into it too much here, but these hydrogens actually do come off one at a time. So they don't all drop off at once. It's actually like a stepwise fashion. So for example, the sulfuric acid will lose its first hydrogen. And then this guy will then lose its second hydrogen. So it actually happens in sort of a two-step process. Although the overall reaction makes it look like they just all drop off at once, but they actually come off kind of one at a time when it does that. It actually gets very, very much harder every time you take off a hydrogen to remove the next one. Um, so it gets really, really hard to do that. Any questions on that there? 
That is also why this guy and this guy are pairs. They are only one H plus difference. This guy and this guy are pairs. They're only one H plus difference. Why this guy and this guy are not pairs. There are two H plus differences between those two. So um, that's really why it has to be just one H plus at a time because that's how they basically come off, basically one at a time. <clears throat> All right, let's talk a little bit about water. Water can act as an acid or base. Uh, here, we've seen a couple of these reactions. In this first case, the water is acting as an acid, so it's donating the H plus over. And in the second case, the water is actually acting as the base. It's accepting the H plus. Water is an amphoteric substance. It could also react with itself, which is pretty much what happens when water is with water. So one water acts as the acid, the other water acts as the base. And we'll just call this first guy the uh, acid. So he'll donate it over to the second water, which is the base. Produces H3O plus and hydroxide uh, in solution. Now there is a relationship between H2O and the H plus and OH minus concentration. And this is what is referred to as KW. KW is the ionization constant for water. Um, we take the KW is equal to the concentration of H plus times the concentration of OH minus, and that equals one times 10 to the minus 14. When you see brackets like this, it means concentration. And it means basically molarity, moles per liter, like we talked about in the previous chapter. So when we look at this, that is pretty much a constant for our purposes here. It can change if the temperature changes, but pretty much you always use that number one times 10 to minus 14. This is the acid part, and that is the base part. So the H plus is the acid part, the OH minus is the base part. This is one of those formulas, as I was talking about earlier, that you could also write, like we see down here at the bottom, KW is equal to H3O plus times OH minus equals one times 10 to minus 14. A reminder that H plus and H3O plus is pretty much the same thing. It's basically the acid part of the solution. So you can write it either way. Um, they both represent really the acid part of that solution why the OH minus represents the base part of the solution. We could use this to calculate whether or not a solution will be acidic, basic, or neutral, depending on how much H plus concentration there is and OH minus concentration. The relationship between H plus and OH minus is this, as one goes up, the other goes down and vice versa. So. As the H plus goes up, the OH minus concentration goes down and vice versa, OH minus goes up, H plus concentration goes down. They run opposites of each other. And really depending on which one you have the most of in the solution, will tell you whether or not it is an acidic solution, basic solution, or if they're equal to each other, it will be a neutral solution if both of those guys are basically equal to one another. So let's take a look at it. If we compare the H plus concentration and it's larger than the OH minus concentration, that means the acid part is bigger than the base part, then it's going to be an acidic solution. If we compare the OH minus concentration and it's larger than the H plus concentration, then it's going to be a basic solution. And as I mentioned, if they are exactly the same, which means they will equal this number, one times 10 to the minus seven, then it will be neutral because they're basically equal to each other. The good news is that it is the same calculation regardless of which one you're calculating. So whichever one they give you, you take one times 10 to the minus 14 and you divide it by the concentration given to you and it will give you the H plus concentration or the OH minus concentration. Depending on which one's given to you, this is definitely a chapter where we do not want to forget these important calculator buttons. 
Otherwise you will be sad, yes? So you definitely want to use your exponent buttons. Hopefully you remember how to do that. It hasn't changed, by the way. You put it in the same way. So shall we see how our exponent buttons work? Here we go. Here are four of them. For each of them, calculate either the H plus or the OH minus. And is it acidic, basic, or neutral? So these are four separate problems. Grab that calculator. Good warm up for Wednesday. I think there's calculations on Wednesday, so it'll be a good warm up, I suppose. I could, but I didn't. Uh, So for the first one, we're looking for the OH minus concentration. And is it acidic, basic, or neutral? Second one, we're looking for the H plus concentration. Is it acidic, basic, or neutral? H plus concentration here. Actually, OH minus concentration there. Acidic, basic, neutral, and H plus. All right. Give it a go. Once again, make sure you use your exponent button. No need for the multiplication button, right? You remember how to do that, hopefully. Okay, let's take a look. So like I said before, the good news on this calculation, it's pretty much the same calculation, regardless of which one's given to you. Once again, we do wanna make sure we use our exponent button here properly. So on the first one, they gave us the H plus, which means we could calculate the OH minus. So the OH minus concentration here, would be one times 10 to the minus 14, which is the value of KW. You always have that number that is there for you to use. Divided by our 3.4 times 10 to the minus four. So that is one exponent button, negative button, 14, divide button, 3.4 exponent button, negative button, and four and equals. And if you do all that, hopefully you end up with, looks like 2.9 times 10 to the minus 11. And we do need to put molarity there since it is a concentration. First off, any question on that number? Remember, if you have the times 10 uh, exponent button, you just put parentheses around everybody. Yeah, Otherwise, it won't come out right. All right. Now that we have the H plus concentration, which is here, <laughs> and the OH minus concentration, we want to actually compare the two and see which one's larger. Which one's larger in this case, the H plus or the OH minus? It is actually the H plus concentration is larger in this case. The H plus concentration is greater than the OH minus concentration. Remember that when you have a negative exponent, the smaller number is actually the larger number because that minus four means I'm going four places that way and putting zeros. That minus 11 means I'm going 11 places that way and putting zeros, right? Which makes it a much smaller number. And that would mean that this guy would be acidic in this case. Any questions on that one there? <clears throat> so continuing on here with the next one, which is also an H plus concentration of 2.6 times 10 to the minus eight. Once again, here, we will take our OH minus concentration one times 10 to the minus 14, which is the KW value. It is a constant that you have always. Putting in our 2.6 times 10 to the minus eight. Once again, using our exponent button correctly here, dividing by 2.6 exponent minus eight. Going to get us uh, something like uh, 3.8 times 10 to the minus seven molar in this case. Or if you don't have your calculator scientific notation, 0 0.0000038, yeah, they might have all that. First off, any question on that calculation there? 
All right, so which one is larger? Is the H plus or the OH minus larger in this case? This is to the minus seven, this is to the minus eight. Minus seven is the smaller number, which means it's actually the larger number in this case. And this means that the OH minus is larger than the H plus concentration. That is basically 10 to the minus 7 versus 10 to the minus 8. And that means that this guy would be basic in this case. Any questions on that? So again, just to illustrate that, if it's still not uh, clicking why that is, if we take the 2.6 and convert it into a decimal, it would be something like this, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, two, six. And that would be our H plus. And if we did it for our OH minus, it would be three, eight, be the OH minus. This obviously has a lot more zeros, or not a lot, lot more, but has more zeros than that guy, which makes it a smaller number. Yeah, let's be converted into a decimal. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> Hopefully your calculators are behaving. Let us see if it continues here. OH minus, which means if we want to calculate the H plus, it's exactly the same calculation. One times 10 to the minus 14, divided by 6.2 times 10 to the minus nine, and this would get us looks like uh, 1.6 times 10 to the minus 6 molar. In this case, uh, it is actually going to be our OH, our H plus, which is a larger value. Uh, so H plus in this case would be greater than the OH minus concentration. Again, comparing these two here. And uh, it is 10 to the minus six versus 10 to the minus nine. And that means that it will be acidic in this case. Any questions on that one there? Once again, if you're getting the front part of the number, but the back part is wrong there, the exponent is probably how you are punching it into your calculator. Yeah. All right, the last one here, also an OH minus concentration. So once again, our H plus concentration will be one times 10 to the minus 14 divided by 8.1 times 10 to the minus three. going to get us something it's like uh 1.2 times 10 to the minus uh 12 it looks like in this case in this case which one is larger you could compare this number to this number and it is this number again it's only three places to the left with zeros this guy is well, places to the left with a bunch of zeros makes it a much smaller number. In this case, the OH minus is larger than the H plus. And that's going to mean that this guy is going to be basic. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> Any question on what we've been talking about here today? All right, we will lay it up there for now.